everybody. Good morning. My name is Malika Saadasar, and I am Google Senior Counsel on Civil and Human Rights. And it is a privilege and joy to welcome you to Google this morning. Um, as many of you know, Google has been very committed to the justice reform space in the last couple of years. And I just briefly want to summarize for you what we have done. We've made a commitment after Brian Stevenson came to our headquarters in Mountain View and challenged us to be proximate, to bear witness to the human costs of mass incarceration. And we have taken him up on that challenge in trying to look at all the ways that we can use our platforms to disrupt mass incarceration. We've done that by digital storytelling around uh, those who are behind bars. We have done love letters, which are digital love letters from children of the incarcerated to their mothers for Mother's Day, to their fathers for Father's Day. And this past Mother's Day, when we did love letters, we put it on our homepage. We've also done short docs around the conditions of confinement for those at Rikers that we were able to put up on our YouTube platform. And we are getting ready in the next six months to release a short doc on cash bail. Uh, and then very proudly, what we had the opportunity to do on our own, our own platform is to make sure that the bail bond industry is no longer able to advertise on search. We have prohibited the bail bond industry from putting ads up on search and worked very closely with Mark Holden on that. And I'm so deeply appreciative to his support in our ability to do that and to have a strong opportunity for, uh, for this commitment on the part of making sure that a predatory industry is not allowed to advertise on search. And then finally, um, we uh, continue to think about ways in which to support the powerful work of NGOs who are also part of this long march and this deep abiding commitment to being able to disrupt mass incarceration. So we are so proud to have you with us today. So uh, overjoyed to be part of this panel. Um, thank you for being here. Thank you for the opportunity to partner with you as NGOs and as influencers in this space. And with that, I will ask Carol Bogart to come up. So we've made a brief film so that people like me don't have to spend a lot of time talking at the moment. I just wanted to say, Thanks, everybody, for coming here. Part of the purpose of the Marshall Project in convening uh, this morning's event and uh, monthly events now going forward here in Washington is to bring together the community of people who work on criminal justice reform in Washington. So please spread the word to your friends about uh, upcoming events. We, I don't want to say that the panel is not the most important thing, but an equally important thing is that you drink coffee and eat pastries and talk to each other and find out what each other is doing in Washington. That's why we've brought everyone together. So um, one other thing you might do if you haven't already is if you're interested in criminal justice reform, you really should be a subscriber to the Marshall Project's morning newsletter. I assume some of you are here because you read about this event in the newsletter, but that's where you're going to find out all all, all of the news from around the web every day relevant to criminal justice reform. So uh, we welcome you to stay informed uh, in that way as well. So without further ado, just a brief film to explain to you what the Marshall Project is. Right now, we're on our way to the Julia Tutwiler Prison for Women. This is a notorious prison that the Department of Justice came in to in 2014 with a lot of really shocking findings. Being there in prison is an irreplaceable experience because we're seeing things we know we would not have been told about. I wanted to do big stories about the prisons because we don't know what's going on and it's really difficult to find out. The Marshall Project is fair-minded and nonpartisan journalism, facts, the story of what's happening in criminal justice in America today. 
Reporters at the Marshall Project are true criminal justice experts. There were new laws that addressed the uh, drug sentencing. We have reporters in all parts of the country. We have reporters following a wide array of issues. We have reporters who really know the nitty gritty details. And in that ecosystem, the journalists are kind of the oxygen. They supply the one thing that everybody else needs to do their jobs, which is credible information. With 700,000 people leaving prisons and jails every year, what happens in here has a big effect on what happens out there. The simple act of providing a space for our voices to be heard can be a powerful tool for change. The Marshall Project is high quality reporting about a much neglected area of American life, which is the criminal justice system, and that system's impact on the people that it touches, on the people that work within it. We try to get the really important issues that are at the core of the criminal justice crisis onto the front pages of newspapers across the country. We've partnered with more than 100 other news organizations from the, the New York Times, the Washington Post, NPR, Teen Vogue, Vice, and increasingly we've been partnering with local and regional newspapers that are just desperate for good news stories to, to publish. When we did a story on the front page of the Tennessean about people who were being held in solitary confinement before they'd even been to trial, that had huge resonance across the state of Tennessee. The governor himself reacted. We don't always think that the media is the most helpful folks in the world, but there are a lot of times when an issue comes up that you don't know about. Nobody would say that's a good idea to have a juvenile end up in solitary confinement in an adult prison. The federal government depends on states and counties to furnish accurate data. Often they don't, but sometimes the, the numbers just tell the story. Anna Flagg is a reporter with the Marshall Project, joins us now to help break down the findings. It's called the myth of the criminal immigrant. So the question is, like, do immigrants actually increase crime? And this study found, no, they don't. Here at the Marshall Project, we have time to get the numbers, be like, mm, this doesn't look right, go back and ask question after question. I was at the New York Daily News for six years, and the more I learn about policing and criminal justice in our country, you realize how broken it is. Can I get the book, that book thing people fill out? Oh, no. That's like the Bible. You can't pass that around. It's like the blue wall Bible behind the blue oh wall. God. Can I just know the name of the record? No, you're not even supposed to know about the book. <laughs> One of the important things about winning the Pulitzer Prize is not only that it was a great honor for the Marshall Project, but also that it sent a signal to other reporters around the country. The criminal justice system is a place to look for important stories that will get recognition. The most rewarding is when you can see a tangible outcome from something you've published published a piece on Attica brutality, and the day after our story published, three guards cut a plea deal, and they installed thousands of cameras in Attica to cover those spaces where guards used to take the inmates for a little informal roughing up. If we're really going to change the system, if the system is going to be reformed, it requires an educated public to understand its problems and what the potential solutions are. Smart and depth journalism is the path to success, because if you're just hitting on an issue because it's very clickable, you're not really helping to solve the bigger problem. I think most journalists feel at some level that what they do is essential to keeping democracy functioning. That's when journalism's at its best. It's highlighting a problem in society, and if we can get people to notice that, then we did our job. Chief of the Marshall Project. Uh, we have a great panel with, uh, for, for the kickoff of this series of events. Sherilyn Eiffel is president and director of the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund, a sort of direct heir to Thurgood Marshall. Um, Weldon Angelos spent more than 12 years in prison for selling a few pounds of marijuana. Uh, he'll talk a little bit about his case and his situation. He's now become a at least half-time uh, advocate for criminal justice reform. Uh, Grover Norquist is president of Americans for Tax Reform and also an advocate of criminal justice reform. I thought 
So the premise of this series is that to find an effective solution to a problem, you have to know how you got there in the first place. You have to have a narrative. So I thought I would ask each of you to talk a little bit about how we got here to this um, system of criminal justice that is not very effective, uh, not very humane, uh, incredibly expensive. Um, start with you, Sherilyn. Great. Thank you so much. Um, Bill and is Malika still here. Thank you for having me and Carol. Um, and um, I'm really thrilled with the work that the Marshall Project is doing. It's incredibly important to us because the Legal Defense Fund, we were formed in 1940. We've been working on, on criminal justice issues since our formation. And it's so critical to have a quality journalistic platform that's willing to elevate these issues that are deeply uncomfortable for many people uh, to think about and to talk about um, because they are a reflection of our worst selves. And when I say um, they are a reflection, I don't mean criminals. I mean the criminal justice system that we have created. So let me just, um, I'm sure that um, my co-panelists will have a lot to share and I just want to maybe begin with um, being unapologetic about the need for us to talk about race in the context of the criminal justice system that we've created because in many ways the criminal justice system we've created um, was born of and premised on the idea of race and social control and it's become a massive social control system that eats federal and state dollars and that controls the lives of um, disproportionately African American and Latino people uh, in this country in ways that are not rational and not rationally related to public safety, but in ways that are related to social control. And it's a, you know, what we do with the criminal justice system is a massive investment. And so I'm actually really glad that we have the opportunity to talk a little bit about money because money is an important part of this and um, is a historically an important part of this. Um, I'm fond of saying that uh, in our country, we are always making investments. I know we say we have to balance the budget and we, we just don't have the money to do all kinds of things, but we always make investments. And the only question is, what will we invest in? And the criminal justice system is the investment, particularly over the last 40 years that this country has decided to make in issues of poverty, race, young people, mental illness, rather than put those investments into the kinds of services that would address uh, each of those populations and problems we have chosen the criminal justice system as the catch-all to address all of those uh, issues. So it's critical that we go back to the creation of a criminal justice system that really is premised in the black codes that were enacted in states following the Civil War. After the Civil War and the passage of the 13th Amendment, abolishing slavery, um, there were real concerns in the South among plantation owners about how they would preserve their workforce, how they would um, continue to have access to black labor which had been free during slavery. There was also the concern about uh, African Americans having uh, gaining political control and independence within a number of jurisdictions. Please remember that in many of these counties in the South, black people constituted the majority of the population. So there were genuine concerns about political power and control. The 13th Amendment uh, was uh, ratified in 1866, the 14th Amendment in 1868, the 15th Amendment in 1870. Um, what ensued was um, the creation of um, a number of laws that came to be known as the Black Codes. And they were essentially vagrancy laws enacted by states to give them the opportunity to essentially get access to black labor and to, in some ways, kind of re-enslave uh, the African male work, African American male workforce. These vagrancy laws uh, required that if you were a black man walking on the road, you had to prove that you were employed. You essentially had to have papers from some white person who employed you. And if you could not prove that you were employed, you were arrested. Um, the uh, swell, swelling of the jail system essentially became the source from which plantation owners could go and could buy labor. Um, I'm sure you've heard of the convict lease system, that um, business owners, plantation owners, um, and in some cases, uh, local jurisdictions 
would use that labor to help build railroads, to work on plantations, to work on light industry, um, and would essentially lease the labor of convicts who were held in the most egregious conditions. Some would say worse conditions than slavery because the new owners didn't care whether you lived or died. Um, but that system, that system of using the criminal law to control the population and to have access to labor and for economic gain lies at the heart of our criminal justice system. And so understanding the beginning of that story is critical to understanding how we end up where we are today. It's not the solution. Obviously, we're hundreds of years from that um, uh, reality. But because Bill asked about how did we get here, I want to make sure we begin with that piece of history that is often skipped over, but that is essential for understanding how even the concept, the narrative about who is a criminal, always remember, we decide what conduct is criminal, right? We, we decide that um, there, there are certain ones that are intuitive, murder and rape and so forth, but we apparently can decide that marijuana is legal or not legal. We can decide that any substance is legal or not legal. We can make all kinds of decisions about what constitutes a crime, white collar and otherwise. That's a societal decision that we make. And those decisions during that period following the Civil War were motivated by racism, the need for power, and the need for social control, and the need for access to free labor. And we should remember that that's a part of our history, and it isn't simply jettisoned by the force of time. It is, these are lessons that are learned, and those narratives continue to be embedded in our thinking about criminal justice today. Okay. Grover, what's your version of how we got here? <clears throat> I guess, well, let me start more recently. Um, the, the, although you did see in all of the southern states and others, all the gun control laws that originally passed, the laws against possessing knives and so on, all were explicitly racially driven, as is the Davis-Bacon Act, which costs a tremendous amount of money to keep black labor out from competing with white unionized labor. So we've actually passed laws that are explicitly uh, racist uh, and criminalized behavior as a result. Um, several things happened that, that made, I'm actually interested in studying how we got it better. Okay, it doesn't surprise me that the government's given a monopoly of something and screwed it up. This is, this is not the only place it does. This is not a surprise. How come things got better? Okay, how, how, did, how did we start to make some progress? Why are dozens of states taking you know, baby steps, but substantial baby steps in the right um, direction? The, the challenge we had was that for a lot of years, uh, the left had no credibility on crime because they, they weren't taking it seriously. And all the, you got all the movies in the 70s and the 80s about, oh, the liberal judge lets everybody out. And that stemmed from things that people thought they were seeing in, in their communities. And all the court decisions that seemed to always favor criminals. And so the left said, we've got this great idea. People didn't hear them. And the right, on criminal justice, and the right wasn't focused on. Um, there was an assumption. I, I think I had it when I was a kid. I, wanted to become a prosecutor or something when I was a lawyer, um, that somehow, you know, well, the government screws up everything and they serve themselves, not the people and the bureaucrats and the people who get paid by the government, um, protect themselves and their jobs at the expense of everything else. But somehow we were supposed to think that guys who ran prisons and judges were somehow immune from that and they were just dispensing justice. And there was a similar blind spot on the military. You said the, ge the generals must be doing it right. We won't have to look there, whereas you wouldn't take that approach towards some new government program that somebody invented. Um, over time, two things happened. The left hasn't yet figured out how to regain its credibility on criminal justice reform, but they have been willing in the states to vote with um, the modern conservative movement, which right on crime, all the state think tanks and activist groups that have gotten uh, together, starting in Texas. I mean, this is a state movement that started to have successes in Texas, where they said, one, it's costing too much. Two, it's bad for families. It's bad for, for people. These people are coming out of prison. You know, this, this is not, um, and you want to make sure they come back and can be employed and not be criminals. Uh, and one of the ways to get resources to deal with some of these uh, training issues and others uh, is to, in fact, uh, stop putting so many people in prison for so long. And the question is, 
who needs to be in prison? Some people, you know, um, are, is this person in prison because we're scared of them or because we're mad at them? And we just, we're mad at you, we're mad at what you're doing and therefore you go in prison. Or you're dangerous. I don't want you walking down the street with other people because you hurt people uh, and you have a track record of hurting people. Um, not annoying them, not offending them, hurting them. Uh, and so uh, you saw across the series of, of states, uh, tremendous steps forward, attacks on the issue of mandatory minimums at the, both at the state level and national. Um, I testified before the House when we were trying to undo the 100 to 1 ratio on crack cocaine. Um, it was 100 to 1 ratio, everything was, you know, there was a, drugs and crimes are put in the same category. And I, I remember actually Gingrich telling me it's drugs and crime, drugs and crime. I always thought that inanimate objects just sit there unless you do something with them. But, but, but we're gonna have a war on inanimate objects. Um, somehow, several things happened. The enthusiasm for prohibition, drug prohibition, specifically marijuana, but across the board in terms of, uh, including how long you send somebody in prison for crack cocaine or white powder cocaine, um, lessened. So the, the excitement about or the interest in prohibition went down, and that undermined some of the questions of why we're having so many people in prison for so long. If you don't really think you should put people in prison for taking bad care of themselves, um, maybe you should relook at the whole structure. Um, you, you also saw a reduction, a secular decline in crime. Uh, and there are all sorts of discussions, when did this happen? Well, it tracks almost completely with when, which states and when they introduce concealed carry weapon permits. And we now have 17 and a half million concealed carry weapon permits. This didn't start until 86 was the first state that wasn't square and actually had street lights uh, that passed concealed carry shall issue uh, permits. Uh, and you saw as people, more people got permits, the, the, the violent crime, not embezzlement, not stealing your car when you're not in it, but confronting somebody, going into a house, mugging somebody, raping somebody, murdering somebody, all of those decline much more rapidly in states with active concealed carry permits and more people getting permits. It's a question of how many people get the permits. Um, and so with crime going down, it became a safer issue for conservatives to address. And there was less of an argument to stand up and say, I'm against crime, make it 50 years. When I was testifying against the concept of mandatory minimums and specifically on crack cocaine, I had in front of me, the list of all the things that were mandatory minimums. They're all press conferences. Some guy got up and said, I really don't like child pornography, 45 years, you know, to mean it, exclamation mark, boom. It's five years for treason, by the way. Um, but, but exciting, sexy crimes are 35, 45, 25 years. And you could just see, we, we passed mandatory minimums on carjacking, which in most of the 50 states were already a crime. But I want a press conference I have to have a bill, and I have to have sentencing and mandatory minimums to show I'm tough. Uh, with some of the judiciary becoming more conservative, the fear that if you give it to judges, they let everybody out of prison is way down. Mandatory minimums were supposed to get you past lousy governors and lousy judges. Um, that's less of a concern. And so it opened the door to have these conversations. Uh, and then we were able to um, address the question of, do we need this many people in prison, and for how long? It does save money. Are there some things you can do with those resources? Um, and then it bleeds into questions of uh, occupational licensing. Texas, they were training people to become uh, barbers, except in Texas, if you're a felon, you can't be a barber. So, I mean, the first thing they add to all of these little guild things they set up for hair weaving or, you know, uh, designing flower formations. They have a license for that in some states. Indoor decorating, they're trying to push down. Um, the, dry, you know, is, the first rule is no felons. And that's because we're, not, we're gonna reduce the number of people who can compete with us in this field. Um, and so you have those issues all coming together. The, 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 the really interesting new jobs that people have in Uber and Lyft and Airbnb with, with no permission required to just do it, okay? You don't need a permit, you don't have to do that. And the other thing, the number of people who've come into that, and, and some of these uh, Uber and Lyft have been fairly good about being open to ex-offenders, ex um, uh, getting jobs there, and not allowing Austin, Texas 
to uh, try and break that. Austin got slapped down hard by the state legislature um, for playing that game. So I, I think a number of things came together. To, and, and the other one is after 2010, um, uh, the Republicans ran the table on state legislatures. So the Texas idea, which um, came in a couple years before 2010, went state to state. And when I would testify in the state legislature, I would say, Texas did this four years ago. And the people who had been doing this start looking at Texas. You mean it's safe. I'm not going to be called weak on crime. And four years ago, it's safe. You mean people didn't lose elections because of it. As a matter of fact, the only real case I can think of is the guy who tried to run to the right in Georgia against the criminal justice firm and got crushed. Might have been a real contender, but failed. It has, we, we haven't had attacks from the right on it because the conservative movement has been so clear that in, in the pushback, sadly, from the attorney general, um, but otherwise, we, one problem, he just happens to be the attorney general, um, uh, we've made some real progress. And I think at the end of the day, I mean, I know some people have other reasons why they might want a different attorney general. I think criminal justice reform is a very good reason to get rid of the attorney general, uh, and a sufficient reason. Uh, but, it, but just to end, there's, this isn't one issue. You've got an uh, issue of over-criminalization. When I started attending a little working group on criminal justice reform in the 90s, it was me and a collection of conservatives who'd all been in prison or had relatives in prison. Um, not, I hadn't had either, but uh, it was interesting to see these people's deep understanding of the issue came from personal knowledge and got them excited. And then, obviously, the, the movement grew. We thought there were 2,000 federal laws. And now there may be 6,000 federal laws and 200,000 regulations that can put you in prison. Um, remember being told by your parents, ignorance of the law is no excuse. Yeah, read me. How many of those 600,000 things that can put you in prison are you, are you aware of? Um, and so that issue raises the, the mens rea, that you can break a regulation or a rule and not know it was a law. like whether you put crabs in paper or plastic or something like that in another country, uh, and you can go to prison for this sort of thing. Those stories really convince people this, this is something's fundamentally wrong here. Civil asset forfeiture, the Washington Post piece, where the police take more money from people than burglars in any given uh, recent year through civil asset forfeiture. They don't give it back to you just because you didn't get convicted necessarily. And so much of it is in small pieces that it's not worth getting a lawyer to get your car back or your $5,000 back. Uh, and so the, keep, the cops keep it. Um, and then prison reform as well and how do we treat people in prison. Uh, and then another wave that came in with all the Christian groups that go in and proselytize in prisons. And one, they spent time in prison. Two, they look around and see, they talk to people, they hear the stories, they've got pretty good information on what's going on, and they come back and tell everybody else, this needs to be fixed, and they speak with real credibility. So I would argue that the credibility with the general public of the critics of the present system have opened people's ears and said, and made it easier to move legislation, and it's, we've had very good success with left-right coalitions. I worked with the ACLU to get a letter um, to, to legalized knives in New York. Tens of thousands of people have ended up with felony arrests and going to jail and getting uh, arrested because they have a pocket knife, which is crime in New York. Uh, Republicans and Democrats got together. These things passed with all the guys from the NRA, who, the state legislators and all the guys from the Black Caucus, and everybody votes together on issues that reduce some of the overcriminalization. 18 states have legalized knives. You may remember or read about the massive wave of knife violence that we had in the early 1960s uh, on Rebel Without a, with a Cause, Rebel Without a Cause and West Side Story. And the, the legislators saw those mass killings with knives and passed laws in all these states because switchblades and drop knives were doing all this stuff. The enforcement on that is selective. The enforcement on that is abusive. And states are repealing them step by step. And you've got the Black Caucus and the NRA both working together in the states. Uh, to get to pull that stuff out and to reduce overcriminalization. So, I think it's a series of things that all have flowed together and made it possible. You know, a couple of years ago, the Marshall Project ran a story. The headline was something like "10 Not Entirely Crazy Reasons: uh, Theories of Why the Crime Rate Went Down," mm -hmm. uh, ranging from more police on the streets to taking the lead out of 
paint and, and fuel. Uh, I don't remember anybody suggesting that it was because concealed carry laws were, were spreading across the country. Uh, there are whole books on the subject, and the only 30, the only 3,000 county study done tracks it immediately. It's actually, it tracks quite well with it. Okay. You both mentioned better the, than lead paint. You both, you both mentioned the, the left-right coalition that is backing a wide range of criminal justice reform issues. Um, Weldon sort of embodies that. Uh, he's got people from the right and people from the left who've taken up his cause. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about your story. Yeah, so um, in my early teens and uh, early, early 20s, I was working on a career in the music industry, um, working with folks like Snoop Dogg and Tupac Shakur's recording group. Um, but I was also selling marijuana on the side. I come from a poor background. So when I was waiting for my music ventures to stabilize, I started selling weed just to pay the bills. I just had a kid. And that sort of put me, I'm from Utah, Salt Lake City, so there's not a lot of you know, musical acts that come from Utah. So it kind of put me in the government's crosshairs. Uh, the Osmonds, come on. <laughs> the Osmonds. <laughs> so, uh, so you know, I got a lot of attention uh, you know, working with these big acts. And um, so while I was waiting for everything to pan out, I was selling marijuana to help you know, raise my son, just had a kid. Um, and you know, the government got word of it and sent an informant to me, and I sold him $300 worth of marijuana three times. Um, and about six months later, I got indicted. My case went federal, which is unusual for the small amount of marijuana. Um, and my sentence was stacked because they had alleged that there was a gun present during the transaction, and they had found a legal firearm in my home, in my safe, and they alleged that that gun was used to protect the drug proceeds. So I was indicted. Um, I was indicted on 20 counts total based on just those three transactions, and I was facing 105 years in prison, mandatory minimums. Um, I went to trial, was convicted on most of them, acquitted on some, and my minimum sentence was 55 years in one day. Um, I was fortunate enough to have a, a, a compassionate judge. He was actually known for being very tough on crime. Um, he was against the, the Miranda uh, rule. He was against the exclusionary rule. He was a uh, proponent of the death penalty. So I was initially worried. Me and my attorney were scared, like, oh, he's going to you know, give me the maximum because I could have got much more. Um, but for, something, for some reason, I guess this was like the first case where he had to sentence someone to such a long time for marijuana. Um, and the issue he took with, with the case was Congress has essentially said that rape, murder, and terrorism, they're all bad, but drug offending's worse. Um, he, he looked at the sentences for uh, r rape in a 10-year-old, which was, I believe, 10 years. Um, uh, Second-degree murder, I believe, was between like 15 and 20 years. Um, terrorism was, was way less, like, like a third of my sentence. So he was like, this doesn't make sense. Now I'm supposed to give him 55 years for selling marijuana three times. Um, so, and, and that got a lot of attention because all this is Judge Cassell, a George W. Bush appointee, uh, you know, known for being one of the you know, tough on crime judges. Um, so this you know, got a lot of people's attention. Um, as he sentenced me, he asked uh, President Bush to commute my sentence. And that was the first time a federal judge has done that. Um, so you know, that uh, kind of helped me build a coalition of people to come around and support me. And, and what's interesting is Senator Mike Lee was actually a prosecutor in the office while I was being prosecuted. Um, my prosecutor had taken the case to him because he was over the appeals. Um, and he asked if this case would be sustained on appeal. And Mike Lee looked at the case and he didn't agree with the sentence. He said, this is ridiculous. He said, yes, it will be upheld because the Supreme Court has already said this is you know, legal. Um, but he was against it. So um, when Senator Mike Lee decided to run for the Senate in 2010, he remembered my case and he remembered what my judge said that only Congress can fix this problem. So when, when he went to the Senate, you know, this is something that he was committed to work on. And so while I was in prison, I had folks from the left and right support me. I had uh, the local mayor, Rocky Anderson, which he's, you know, very liberal. Um, you know, and I was in the entertainment industry, so I had, you know, some people pushing for me. And then Coke Industries got involved, particularly Mark Holden. Um, and they rallied around me, and we just had a coalition of people come together and ask for a presidential commutation. Um, and in 2016, I was finally released after serving 13 years. Um, and before I got out, I knew I was getting out when I got the word I was getting out, you know, I made a commitment to everyone that was in there that I'm going to do everything I can in my power to fight for y'all. So I left a lot of people in there, some people whose cases are more compelling than mine that don't deserve to be in there. 
So when I got out, I immediately hit the ground running. I started working on a documentary. I'm working on a, a book, music, everything to try to change this tough on crime narrative that's been around for about 50 years. Um, we've teamed up with uh, Mark Wahlberg. He actually picked up my documentary. So we're doing a feature documentary and a docu-series. And we have everyone from Charles Koch to Snoop Dogg um, coming together in this film to try to change the narrative and try to get, see some real reform. Great. I want to talk a little about money. One of the um, things that you hear among the more conservative um, advocates of criminal justice reform is that it'll create a windfall for the taxpayers. You know, it's kind of commonly known that it costs as much to keep a prisoner in jail for a year as, as a tuition at a good college. Um, but the alternatives to incarceration aren't free. Uh, you, alternative programs, job placement, you have to have um, licenses, um, you need drug treatment, uh, mental health, mental illness counseling, all, all of those, and housing. So is, is that a little bit of a myth that you can save tons of money by? No, two things. I, I run a taxpayer group, but I think the saving of money thing is the least interesting or important part of this. This is the government destroying lives. Um, and, 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 and it costs money when the government destroys lives. Uh, <clears throat> surprise, surprise. Um, the, there's a bunch of savings to be had from when you don't. Uh, Texas has dropped several prisons. It, standard talking points used to be two. I think we're up to five or something. The prisons that they were planning to build that they didn't, prisons that they're uh, shutting down. Uh, that saves a bunch of money. Uh, but there's no cost to saying we're not going to lock up people who smoke marijuana. That doesn't cost anybody anything. That's just getting the government out of people's lives and letting people yes, do what they want. Uh, you know, the 200,000 regulations that can put you in prison, some of them may make sense. Somehow I doubt 200,000 make sense. Uh, you know, 6,000 federal laws, really? I mean, do we look at these every once in a while? We've been talking about doing a base closings bill where you say, could we get a bunch of lawyers, Republicans, Democrats, liberals, Democrats, look at all the federal laws and say, which ones, you know, made a lot of sense in 1820, <clears throat> but less so now, or should we go away? And then let Congress up and, as they do with closing military bases, allow those to go away and just look at it every once in a while to do it. Um, when you don't put people in prison, the drug courts and other approaches, uh, Texas has both re saved money and reinvested in other parts. Most of the uh, reforms have included both some reinvestment, particularly in, in training and in dealing, uh, dealing with people with drug problems. Uh, yeah, but this is, this is not to save money. Um, it doesn't need to cost more money, but it doesn't, looking at that number, that's it's a nice benefit, but when you're getting out of the business of ruining lives, um, I think that's helpful. You know, not having stupid wars saves money. It also saves lives. Yeah, I, I think there's, you know, we need to slow down a little bit and be realistic about this. Um, so two things. One, there actually is a cost to um, closing down prisons and not incarcerating so many people because there is an entire industry that exists around prisons. And, you know, even if we leave aside private prisons, which are actually a fraction of the, of the prisons in this country, um, you know, it's the building of prisons. It's the vendors who service prisons and who service prisons with all of the things that are needed to contain prisoners. It's the correctional officers who have a very strong union uh, and who, you know, for whom the prisons are the principal uh, employer in many rural communities um, around the country. There are forces that have real concern about uh, the closing of prisons and about reducing mass incarceration from that perspective, that there is a livelihood that some Americans experience that is associated with mass incarceration that provides jobs and an infrastructure that matters to them and their communities. And to pretend that that's not true um, is to underestimate the kind of resistance and the um, location of that resistance to reducing mass incarceration. So that's number one. Number two, um, I've never talked about savings. I only talk about repurposing. That's why I said what I said at the outset, which is that we're always investing. We're going to spend the money somewhere. And the question is, where do we want to spend this money? I'll give an example. 
policing, which we haven't talked about at all, um, and which somehow has eluded this at least right coalition um, around issues of criminal justice reform. Um, and this is why I think we can't take race out of the equation, because racism makes you do things that are irrational, that waste money, that are bad policy. Um, and so um, if you look at what the federal government provides to, we took a look actually at, the, at 24 police departments, all of whom have been involved with issues of um, discriminatory pr policing over the past few years. So North Charleston, Chicago, uh, New York, and so forth, where we've had high profile instances of police killing unarmed African Americans and evidence of disparities in racial stops and so forth. Um, the Justice Department, through the COPS program and through the Burn JAG um, program, has contributed um, over $500 million b between 2010 and 2016 to those, to the police departments in those 24 cities. Over $500 million. Each of those departments regularly churns out settlements uh, to those who are victims of unconstitutional policing. Now we have a law in this country, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, um, which, you know, it's provision that is probably the most important, I think we think about it as a public accommodations law, critically important, but one of the most important provisions of it is Title VI. Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 says that the federal government cannot provide funds to any program that engages in discrimination. It was included in Title VI as a way to withhold money from southern school districts that refused to comply with Brown versus Board of Education and were engaged in racial discrimination in schools. So we have police departments that are engaged in discrimination, some who have been found by the Justice Department to engage in discrimination, some who have been found uh, by civil rights groups suing police departments to have engaged in discrimination, and yet we are churning out all of this money to these police departments, even though Title VI says we are not supposed to. So there is a, a, a dollars component to this issue, but if you're not willing to confront why is there not then um, a right-left coalition around policing reform and around dealing with unconstitutional policing and racial discrimination in policing, it leads you back to the issue of race. And so when you skip over things and you say, you know, that people have press conferences to make these, you know, laws about carjacking or all of the ways in which the federal laws expanded in the 1980s and 1990s, before that press conference was some terrible crime involving a black person carjacking a white person that created the circumstances that made that politician want to get in front of that microphone and say we need to now have a federal carjacking law. Because race provides an easy way for people to think about how you quickly respond, irrational or not, to this fear of crime which has been so deeply racialized for so many centuries. And when we talk about these mandatory sentences that Wendell described and the taking of a life 55 years, the reason that, you, that, that these laws could be created so callously and we could imagine the taking of a life is because the, the people that we imagined would be most subject to these laws are black and brown people and that's the truth. And if that's the imagination about who's going to be most affected by the laws, that has affected how harsh those laws are. Wait. So the last thing I want to say, just because I think it's important when we talk about how did we, how do we, because this is all about narratives and how do we get where we are, um, you know, around the crack powder piece, absolutely right left coalition on getting us from 100 to 1 to, you know, 1 to 1, and we're still not at 1 to 1, we're still at 18 to 1. Um, I, the Legal Defense Fund did not support the Fair Sentencing Act because it was 18 to 1, and we believe it should be 1 to 1. We don't think that if you've discovered something that you know is unfair and discriminatory that you should say, well, just make it a little bit discriminatory. And we actually represent clients who are still in jail because of the disparity, because of the, the uh, disparity and the lack of retroactivity on the, on the, under the Fair Sentencing Act. But how did we end up with 100 to 1 between crack cocaine and powder cocaine? <clears throat> There was no pharmacological reason. It's because an entire narrative was developed around crack cocaine about the crazed black crack addict who could not be contained. And there was a story that was created around crack that very much had to do with race. And so if we don't, 
acknowledge that. If we don't acknowledge that, if, it didn't, if we didn't have the work of people like Nikichi Taifa, who's here at the Justice Roundtable and was talking about these issues early on and exposing that reality, we don't get to the Fair Sentencing Act. Not to say there were not lots of players at the table, but you can't deny the reality of race at the core of it. And so if you don't deal with it, this is what you're going to revisit again in all of the areas that Grover's identifying. There is a racial narrative that um, leads us to, to adopt policies that are irrational, that cost money, that are inhumane, and so forth. And so we've got to marry these things. I'm all for the pragmatism. I love when people say, you know, it's, it, we don't have the money, we should be investing money in college, we're going to save money, whatever is your pragmatic reason why we should reform the criminal justice system. But if there's not also a humanity narrative that goes with it, then we're never going to get to where we need to get to. Because so long as we can imagine that whatever mistakes we, we make, whatever the worst of the worst is, we can revisit that on those people, then we're going to continue to have these, um, this irrational and inhumane criminal justice system. Yes. Grover, yeah. you want to respond? No, we were talking about originally on money, and you brought up the money on the opposition. I was suggesting that saving money was not part of a big part of the argument for criminal justice reform. And it's there. State legislators like the idea that they don't necessarily have to waste <clears throat> money doing something that's not constructive. The states that have done steps in the direction of criminal justice reform have seen crime fall as faster, faster than in other states. It has not only, we're not trading your safety for a few bucks. That, you know, we'll save some money on taxes and, well, there'll be a few more murders. There have been fewer murders, fewer rapes, and, and the, the, the kind of crime people worry about has gone down in those states, um, partially because you can focus on um, uh, real crimes in, 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 instead of vices. Uh, vices are not crimes. Sometimes vices are turned into crimes, but are, are criminalized, but they're not crimes against other people. They're people being stupid with themselves. Um, but there has been able to be a broad coalition on making all these steps because people have focused on uh, what's happening. Um, Ferguson was a very interesting case. The White House brought me all of their data and said, you can use this, it's not really, and gave it to us because what they discovered in Ferguson was that the uh, head of the finance department was sending emails out to the cops. This is where you put your speed traps. Because there was an accident there last week? No, because that's where you make the most money. Uh, and they were driving all the police. You've seen the horrible things. There were more uh, outstanding fines than there are people in Ferguson. And they were using the police as the IRS. And then they wondered, Gina, why does the community not get along with the police? Because every time you see a cop, he's putting a ticket because you're back, you know, your, your, your light's broken or you know, they claimed you were speeding. Um, and the, the, the whole of the police department was driven by revenue. And the fix there was to, it was a statewide fix, because you can't get the city to fix themselves. And they limited the amount of states to collect too much, cities, cities to collect. And so a lot of these cities that made no sense in and around St. Louis, they're little teeny cities, and basically they're set up as speed traps, um, and have merged because you don't need two mayors, and you don't need two police chiefs, and you don't need all this other stuff because really should, that wasn't big enough to be a real city or town in the first place. And if you don't need that much money, you don't need the police out there stealing it from people. Uh, so if you get the cops out of the business, this, this whole fines and things, I worked with the California guys, we finally are down to zero people right now, I believe, but it took a while. We, we didn't go from 14% of the people in California driving on revoked licenses because they owed somebody fine money, okay? Not because they'd run into somebody, not because they were drunk driving, not because they endangering anybody at all, but because they owed fines. If you owed fines, it's revoked. Now, try and drive to work in LA, you can either lose your job or drive and pick up a felony when they, arrest, when they stop you for driving without a license, or worse, a suspended license because you're a bad person. And they tack that stuff on and they, I want to, take what California did nationally, that you never lose your driver's license except for misuse of a car. You do not use your driver's license. When I just got my driver's license re-upped here in um, DC, which was amazingly unpainful compared to previous efforts, um, they wanted to know if you had any fines. I 
discovered I didn't. Uh, any outstanding driver's license, uh, parking permits. They, this is the collection point, okay? Um, and you couldn't have a driver's license unless you did that. So this idea of taking away people's ability to get to work or to live their lives because you're helping them collect their, their tax dollars through fines, add fines <coughs> to the list of crimes. You think about crimes as things people go to jail for. Crimes are also things you get tagged for, you get fined. Uh, and then if you don't pay them, you can end up going and to I just, jail. I completely agree with Grover on this, absolutely. We just filed an amicus brief earlier this year in a case out of um, LaGrange, Georgia, in which the local utility company turns off your utilities if you haven't finished paying your fines and fees to the court system, right? So this is, this is a very, very serious issue. Um, but just to you know, be very clear about Ferguson, the other p data overlay, right, was the um, outrageous disproportionate stops of African Americans who became ensnared in the fees and fines um, system. The reason they were able to, and I've, I've actually driven it, so you, you drive through these, these little towns with different speed limits, it's unbelievable. And um, you don't know which town you're in. You don't know which town you're in, you don't know what speed limit it is, but when you looked at the data, the data showed that African Americans were uh, stopped at a hugely disproportionate rate to whites, although when they were stopped and, <clears throat> stopped and searched, but when they were stopped and searched, it was whites that had the highest percentage of uh, having actual contraband. So um, the system itself was doing exactly what Grover de de described. It was feeding itself. It was ensnaring people in the system of fines and fees. It was using the police department to essentially um, be, the, be the IRS of the town. But it could do it and was doing it on a deeply racial basis knowing that many of these poor African Americans could not unensnare themselves from this system and would continue to rack up these fines. And that's the reason that we even know about Ferguson. We only know about Ferguson because of issues of race. Most of you in this country did not even know about the fines issue um, until Ferguson. So it is a window in. And, and I would say the same would be true if you think about, if I say the word stop and frisk to you right now, you know exactly what it is. Why do you know what that is? Because of some right-left coalition? No, you know what that is because a group of organizations over 10 years worked on this issue. There was an organizing component. There was a narrative component. There was a litigation component. The organization I lead, the Legal Defense Fund, was part of the litigation team that challenged Stop and Frisk. Um, a completely irrational policy that completely turned a generation of young black and brown people against law enforcement by harassing and stopping them, 650,000 stops, allegedly to try to find guns, essentially no guns being found in comparison to the number of stops. And we had to sue to make that, to make that end um, and to begin this consent decree process. And now around the country, we know what stop, we know that there is a phenomenon that involves law enforcement officers stopping young black and brown people uh, on the street over and over and over for no real law enforcement purpose. Um, and the ending of that process is, is powerful and important in New York because it has not correlated with an increase in crime because the crime rate in New York, the violent crime rate, continues to go down. And so we recognize that there are irrational policies that do destroy lives and particularly because, and I think um, there was some reference to this earlier, we do a lot of work in employment discrimination around criminal backgrounds checks, the misuse of criminal backgrounds checks. Now that we are off paper, a mere arrest can stay on your record forever, even if that arrest was never pursued and even if you were never charged. It continues to show up. And so employers who misuse criminal, I'm not saying you can't use criminal backgrounds checks, but who misuse it, who use it as a bar to employ, employment, are, <clears throat> are participating in what could be the creation of a permanent class of unemployable people. That, you, just heard in the, you heard in the video, 700,000 people get out of prison a year, right? But even just being intent, just being arrested, just being charged, it still shows up. We just settled a, a massive case this year with Target and with WMATA, the Washington Metro system, for their misuse of criminal backgrounds checks. And we're really excited about having settled these two cases. There are employers who are doing a great job. Johns Hopkins uh, in, in Baltimore is, is, a, is a hirer of, of formerly incarcerated people, and they're committed to that. But there are many industries where this is becoming a kind of blanket bar. And so much of our employment discrimination work, we have moved to challenging the misuse of criminal backgrounds checks because you can't be talking about criminal justice reform if you're imagining that people freed from the system have become a kind of permanent unemployable class in America. And, and also picking up people who've been arrested and treating them as if they've <clears throat> been convicted. The 
uh, this is what Austin, um, was just in Austin, they finally, the state had to beat Austin City Council senseless and say you can't uh, go after Uber and Airbnb, let people alone. But what they were doing was requiring um, checks, uh, which they knew would have all sorts of false negatives and make it difficult to hire people. And, and Uber said, this is so important, we shut down in Austin rather than allow any other state or city to do this to us uh, and require this background check, just check with the FBI list, which is littered with false negatives. Cert, I mean, certain ethnic groups have more names that are more of the same, or at least the people reading them, and that you get more false negatives with Hispanics and a and, and number of different immigrant groups um, when, you, when you use that. That, that the FBI report list um, or any of the new lists that they think of, of coming up with. But again, part of this is overcriminalization. Stop and frisk is annoying if they stop and frisk you, don't find anything the way they did with me when I went into Burning Man this year. Um, but if they, it's more annoying if they find something. Okay. Or if plant it, something. Or, or yeah. yes. Or but, but they can only plant something because that something has been made illegal. They can't stick a knife in your pocket and say aha unless they first made carrying a knife illegal or marijuana or a gun for self defense. I mean, I, I sat in this jury pool here, and there was a case where a guy in D.C. owned a gun, and he was on, he was on trial for having a gun. And the guy next to me said, "What's this about? Did he shoot someone? Nope. Did he threaten someone? Nope. He just has a gun. Yeah." I always carry guns. Not safe in this town. Um, you know, you can't criminalize people's decisions to protect themselves and then hold it against them with the stop and frisk stuff. So it really does get problematic. I, I would just put one factoid out there because as we are coming to closure on getting um, the uh, crack cocaine, white powder cocaine disparity um, to one to one, I kind of like zero to zero as an option. But anyway, one to one. Um, there was this discussion, the Republicans and Democrats, and the Republicans were saying, you know, tell you what, um, we'd, uh, we'll vote to get rid of this, but uh, we would like you guys to point out that the Black Caucus led the fight to pass the original bill, and they had the list of co-sponsors, which I have. Um, and the other guys said, well, we'll caught, quit saying it's racist if you quit pointing out that the Black Caucus was in the leadership of passing this bill. And so they quit kicking each other under the table, and it was a 100% hundred, hundred vote in the House. It had to be passed by unanimous consent, which meant any jerk could have stood up on the floor and been on Fox News that night, you know, I stopped legalizing crack cocaine. Nobody did. That's, we had 100% of the congressmen. Nobody wanted to go be famous that night. That is the consensus. But one of the things that delayed it was people who are, you know, Charlie Rangel was an original co-sponsor. The head of the Black Caucus, Dixon, was an original co-sponsor. So was Mickey Leland, the co who the next year was on it. This was this incredibly bipartisan, everybody in bill, led by the urban community. I'm so glad you brought this up. This is really important because this brings us to this moment. And I actually want to let Wendell talk because, um, but I do want to say this because we are in a moment when we have an opportunity to address precisely what this panel is supposed to talk about, which is narratives. And the point that Grover just raised actually goes directly to that issue. Because um, the, the conversation about the Black Caucus supporting um, the crack leading. powder disparity. Leading. Leading, supporting yep. the Black okay. It is because the truth is that we, we also need to have a conversation and narrative about what our public safety alternatives are. There are no communities more besieged, distressed, engaged, around issues of violence within their own communities than African-American communities. We suffer with this violence in our communities. I know people say, where are the marches? They happen all the time. I've lived in Baltimore for a very long time. They happen all the time that people are engaged in efforts to bring peace to their communities. And the options that we are presented with are always options about policing and incarceration, harsher incarceration. Those are the only two. Nobody was saying, wow, we have this drug epidemic with crack. What's causing it? Where's the crack coming from? Why are our young people so vulnerable? What's happening with women? What kinds of services can we offer? It was just say no. It was police and harsh incarceration. How about ending, and so, I'm not, ending wait, prohibition? Wait. And, so, and so, no, no, I'm talking about what was on the table at that moment which caused this leadership from the Black Caucus. Because too often we have accepted 
the limited range of options that have been presented to us to deal with the real and true public safety issues in our community. And I actually think now, at this moment, what I'm hearing and what the organizers who work for the Legal Defense Fund are hearing is people in communities wanting to talk about alternatives to public safety. That it's not about getting more police. Remember the 100,000 police officers, right? That was the big deal that was supposed to make us all safe. But what if we reimagined public safety in a way that reimagined how you use police officers? What if you only called police officers? You didn't call them because your, your bipolar son is behaving erratically and you're frightened, right? That there were, there were, there were services embedded within the community. There were public safety officers who are trained around mental health issues who you call when they're mental health issues. And that you only called the police when you were really dealing with some kind of violent crime. What if we had the kinds of service, what if there were a, a, a youth core, C-O-R-P-S, right, officers who were trained in how to deal with young people. And that's who you called when the kids were outside making noise at night rather than call the police, right? So now people are beginning to think differently about should we be reimagining? Is this a moment to reimagine a narrative around public safety? And that's how you're going to undercut that statistic that people like to drag out about the Black Caucus. Because it's true, but it is true because of this narrow, cramped, limited offering that has always been the only thing made available to us to deal with the issue of violent crime when you have people in your community who are hurting, who are frightened, and who want a way out. And we see that now in cities like Chicago and Baltimore. And if we go back to that model, where the only thing that we think is going to solve it is saturating with more police officers and ramping up penalties and creating new forms of, of, of crime, then we're going to end up in the same place. So we have a moment, actually, right now to learn from that past and to think more expansively about, about what are the options that are available to us in terms of public safety. Do we have time for a question or two from the, um, from the audience? Joe, I'll pass you a hand mic. Uh, thank you so much. Nikichi Taifa with Open Society. And I convened the Justice Roundtable. Thank you so much for this very robust um, conversation. And Cheryl, I'm glad you um, brought up the issue dealing with narrative change and what was happening back then with the crack um, cocaine uh, scenario. And we always have a situation where there are unintended consequences to what <laughs> goes on. And once these issues rise to the surface, Charlie Rangel was the first person actually to uh, 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 introduce the first crack cocaine equitable sentencing act um, before the 1994 mm -hmm. uh, crime bill, which totally ignored uh, the issue. But what my uh, question is, is that um, there is no parole in the uh, federal system. We know that parole is a bad word, you know, uh, truth and sentencing, and we also know that there are issues with parole, no question about it. But my question is really to the right, uh, to Nova, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Grover, you know. Mm -hmm. Where is your, where is the right's position with respect to the second look process? I know the ABA has done a lot of um, um, uh, studies on uh, research in terms of the implementation of a judicial second look. I'm not saying it has to be judicial, but because there is no parole, because we have the system of mass incarceration, everybody doesn't have the right left um, coalition, the, the phenomenal right, le right left coalition that Weldon Angelos had. Everybody doesn't have Kim Kardashian um, going to bat with them um, for Alice uh, Johnson. In fact, everybody can't get clemency as critically important as clemency is. So what do we do with those values? <laughs> numbers of others in the federal system um, who are totally and completely just languishing in terms of death by incarceration. Yeah. I guess a couple things. First of all, some of those, one of the reasons we're sympathetic to somebody who's in prison for too long for selling marijuana is we ask, why would you be in prison at all? 55 sounds like a long number. One would sound like a big number if it was you. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> the, you know, what? So part of you know, part of the question is, how many laws do we have? And if you have too many laws, by definition, there are, they're selectively enforced. Um, and because even the police don't know all the laws. Um, and never mind, we don't know all the laws. So they will be selectively enforced. So fewer laws, simpler laws. Um, I think rethinking mandatory minimums, I mean, th this really came out of the, 
we don't trust judges. We've seen people get off that shouldn't get off and on violent crimes, uh, not on vices. Uh, so there, there are a number of ways to, to get at a challenge. I mean, the idea of taking a second bite at the apple um, may, may be a very good idea. Um, you, you have to worry about people wondering, is this guy who murdered somebody who we were promised was going away forever because we didn't execute him because you said you'd keep him in prison forever because he killed somebody. Um, if you break down that trust, then people go up, oh, chop their heads off. We're not, we're not buying this stuff about you know, uh, life in prison for murderers um, if that's not happening. So you have to build a coalition there. I don't think it's impossible to do. Um, and, but I, I think it also brings open the question of the people who are most sympathetic to a second look are the people who shouldn't have been in jail in the first place or who should have been in for a short, discreet period, you know, whack them on the head, don't do that again. Not, this is the rest of your life or 30 years of your life taken away from you. Um, so I, I, I see the challenge. I'm just wondering whether you can fix it upstream easier than fixing it downstream. Yeah. Well, we start both, see who gets there first. There's, look, this is such a big mess that there's no one way to cut the Gordian knot. There's no one silver bullet that fixes everything. We just have to keep moving in on it. Federal, state, we thought we'd fixed civil asset forfeiture in a number of the states, and then they go around us and get the feds to do it. Um, so everybody in New, New Mexico was supposed to be safe, and now they're not. Um, we just have to keep plugging the holes and get into Attorney General, because he's the problem on civil asset forfeiture. He's also the problem on smarter on crime, and that's really the point that Wendell was talking about, talking about getting stacked. You know, you get charged with you know, several things. They, they, they can just kind of pull them all together to get you to that 100 years. Yeah. Um, I and as you know, against stacking. And as you know, I thought that was the one good no, thing. No, Attorney General Holder smart on crime was to end the stacking in the federal system. And uh, Attorney General Sessions announced that and sent a letter to all U.S. attorneys saying that they were to charge to the full, ex full extent. Yeah, that's what um, I was charged under that original Ashcroft memo that um, mm -hmm. Sessions brought back. Okay, I was wrong. I thought there was one good thing about him. Well, he said that on the Senate floor. <laughs> he said he, there was a problem with the stacking feature on the Senate floor. But yeah, now that he's Attorney General, about? he's, okay. mm -hmm. I don't know. Okay. Somebody had a trusted question him. over here. Part of juvenile justice messaging reform is um, kids grow out of it. You know, teenage behavior, do stupid things. The vast majority grow out of it. Best thing you can do is no system involvement. Mm -hmm. In this moment we're in with Justice Kavanaugh and teenagers and, you know, some people using the boys with will be boys and obviously the incredible pushback to that. How how can this moment um, be used in a positive way in the universe of juvenile justice reform? Or is this a setback for some of the juvenile justice no, reform narratives? It, I think it'll be a setback for a while, but it, politicians have no shame that this is a, a one-time hit on one guy. They're not going to use it against everybody. I mean, Booker, uh, Senator Booker is the guy who has come out with and demanded that you, help, you erase things people did is when they were in high school or college, um, as his, whether they sh you know, shot somebody. Um, so now to play the other game, it, it's for a particular purpose. I don't think it's gonna be permanently damaging. I think it's embarrassing to the people who are doing it because they understand how they undermine criminal justice reform if you're actually driving that narrative. Um, but I think win, lose, or draw, this was a one-off project. So I think that's, um, I mean, it's so many levels of just false because the the, the issue with Justice Kavanaugh is actually, at least to my mind, I mean, we, we represent people you know, who are on death row, we represent people who committed uh, uh, crimes or who are, have been a judge to have committed crimes when they were teenagers, and, um, and, I, and I believe that everyone deserves a second chance at, at life, right? So um, certainly for those who were juveniles, and the Supreme Court has said you know, no death penalty for juveniles um, who committed their cr crimes as teenagers and so forth. So, but that's a far cry from whether or not you get a seat on the United States Supreme Court. That's not what criminal justice reform is about. So this, the, just Judge Kavanaugh's, the, the issue with Judge Kavanaugh is actually not about whether or not he's to be prosecuted 
for something that he did as a young person, number one. Number two, to me, the principal issue for me is about credibility, is whether or not you tell the truth about what you did. Many people have done terrible things when they were young, and you tell the truth about it. Um, when you're asked about it as an adult, my, I'm judging him as an adult. Are you, as an adult, telling the truth about your life? That's the question um, before you sit on the United States Supreme Court. So whether or not um, there are issues about whether or not the underlying con conduct can or should be prosecuted, it is about, as an adult, do you tell the truth when you are sworn and under oath? So there is no embarrassment in asking that question of somebody who wants to be on the United States Supreme Court and expecting a truthful answer. To answer your question about whether there's something here that can be mined to address juvenile, juvenile justice reform, um, probably not this week, <laughs> but I do think that at some point there will be some reflection pieces, and I've been kind of writing one in my head myself about this very issue, about how we talk about young people. Um, as we go forward, as LDF goes forward over the next few years, we're focusing on um, criminal justice practices that touch the emerging adult population. We're actually quite interested in uh, you know, 17 to 25. For African Americans, that's very often the population that criminal justice laws are cruelest to um, and, and the lives that are most easily snatched. But the truth is just being touched by the criminal justice system in that age bracket can change the entire trajectory of your life. So, um, so I am quite, quite thoughtful about that, and I'm thoughtful about precisely what you said at the outset, which is that we know, which is why the Supreme Court you know, was, was able to address the issue of, of the death penalty for those who committed uh, crimes when they were teenagers. We know more about the brain development now. We've read that amazing amicus brief from the American Psychiatric Association about the development of the human brain. We know that full moral culpability doesn't really ha kick in until around 24 and 25. We know about impulsiveness, inability to understand consequences and so forth in that population. And so we're focusing on that population. And so I care actually quite deeply about how we're talking about what people do when they're young. But that is a separate issue. I just want to be clear one more time than what you say as an adult under oath about what you did. Yeah, and I think it makes, perfect sen it makes perfect sense for us to expect someone who's going to sit on the United States Supreme Court to be truthful under oath when they appear before the Senate Judiciary Committee. Um, this, is not a, this is not a criminal trial. Um, it is a, a search for um, understanding the fitness of an individual to sit on the United States Supreme Court. So I think there will be some reflection pieces here about that. I think right now we need to stay focused on what is the question, which is about the fitness to sit on the Supreme Court, not based solely on what you did as a 17-year-old, but on what you say about what you did and whether you're truthful about what you did uh, today. The answer is no. They're going right, to go right past this. It won't come up again. Um, hello, my name is Alexis, and uh, I have a question Alexis. for the oh. whole panel. Oh, I think, given the you know five million dollars that are being or fifty million dollars that are being spent on policing, the two million dollars that are being spent on police who are abusing their power and settlements uh, occurring as a result of that, given the people that have died at the hands of the police who are no longer on this earth because of that. Where do you see the work of abolition in that framework within the legislative field, within Congress, uh, within local uh, legislatures going? And how do people, organizers, organizations push that, uh, that happening? Well, I'll just jump in again just to reiterate what I said earlier. I think that opening up the conversation about public safety is the way to begin to be more radical in terms of thinking about what what should happen in a in a prison system, um, and and we don't we we're not having that conversation yet. We're only imagining it within the framework of how we see it now. And when you in the in the if you go from the framework of our current criminal justice system and then say abolition, that's a far jump. There there is some underlying work that has to be done. And so I think that the the work for organizers who are working in communities. Um, like the organizers on our staff, is to begin to create places where people can convene and talk about what would you imagine if you could public safety would look like in your town? What would be the building blocks of public safety? What would be the services that would be needed? How would schools be involved? What would be the core that would be developed? How would community colleges train people to be part of that youth core? 
Um, what would it mean to be a public safety officer? Maybe some would be police officers who would be armed, but others would have other kinds of duties and so forth. I think when we begin to think more expansively, because there will always be a need for public safety in a, in a big country, um, the question is, are there other models that we can begin to incubate and adopt that will, will loosen the valve a little bit so that we can think more creatively and um, radically right, about what a prison system would look like or not look like? I thought you were going a different place with the question when you're talking about abusive police practices or individual policemen who but misbehave. Mm -hmm. um, there are challenges in building left-right coalitions try and get the left or the Democrats in Congress to deal with something with the police union contracts that make it impossible, almost impossible, to fire somebody, even after they misuse a gun um, or take a life. So uh, that's a challenge, and I don't know how to fix it. But if you look, civil service laws are tough enough in, in cities. Uh, the cities that you've pointed to that are most abusive have the strongest unions, the strongest civil service laws. You cannot fire me. I own my job. Uh, I will run my job as I see fit. You don't get to tell me what to do. Um, and no matter what I do, I've got a union rep to come in and keep me getting paid. These guys are always getting paid. You know, you, there's a shooting. He beat someone to death in front of a TV camera. And he's a suspended on full pay for the next month. I'd like to be suspended on full pay for a whole month. Uh, if I wasn't self-employed. But the, um, th there's a challenge there that when you're trying to work through to get to the other side, um, we, ha we have a problem with the structures of organized laborers in big city police uh, operations and the venality of civil asset forfeiture everywhere, but also in small towns mm -hmm. that people drive past. And the sheriff gets to pull you over, take your money. You've heard the terrible cases where they take your, your debit card and empty out your bank account because maybe that was drug money. You know, we didn't find any drugs on you, but we're checking and we'll have to check all the money. Um, and, and then if they take too much, the guys that they take a million dollars or, you know, from, they complain and go to court. But how much would a lawyer cost? To do that, and you've got a life to live. How much time do you want to spend going back to some rinky-dink town that you drove through uh, on on the way to someplace else? Um, so there are some very real organizational structures that get in the way. There are people who benefit from overcriminalization. I mean, um, Senator Booker wanted to be a real leader in criminal justice reform, and he backed out because the Center for American Progress, a left-wing think tank, said, "No, we like." No mens rea. We like putting people in jail who who signed, who wrote something wrong on a, uh, wrote down some piece of paper wrong, corrected it later. Doesn't matter. That's a felony. It's a regulation. You get threatened with jail. They liked that. Okay. Uh, they went after one of the uh, larger, but it was small, Muslim American foundations after 9/11 because once they'd written five billion dollars in instead of five million, and where everything else was right, but five billion, you may have read about the headlines about the five billion dollars must be from Saudi Arabia, and they went after them and were prosecuting on a, a miss, a typo. Okay, um, it wasn't used to defraud anybody. They weren't borrowing off the five billion dollars. They just, when you looked at their records, one place they did it wrong. That's, and that's, that's the kind of overcriminalization yeah. and lack of mens rea. But that, that's a distortion of the, of, of the concerns about the mens rea provision, and I'm, I don't even want to go into it because it's not responsive to the question that you asked. I actually wondered also if you go into it. I, it I also important. wondered if Wendell had any thoughts about abolition. What do you think about whether abolition oh, is about like whether we should have prisons at all? Like, what should, you know, <laughs> have you given well, it? I think what, should, would, what would you have, what do you think would have been fair? Right, in your as circumstances. As yeah. I think probation, honestly, um, I think that would have worked. Just be, going through the system, getting, you know, going to court, even being sentenced, the felony, of course. I mean, I definitely don't want that on my record forever, but uh, I think even just probation or even some months would have been sufficient. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I mean, honestly, I wasn't really that bad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How about moving to, so, uh, <laughs> move to Colorado? Move to Colorado. Yeah, that. So as far as the other question, like, I, I think prison should be reserved for, like, serious crimes where there's actually real victims. Definitely. Um, yeah, we can either fight about the mess, or we can go upstream and stop sending all these people into prison for things that aren't crimes. And mens rea is a huge part of this, and it has to be dealt with. Because if you don't know it's a crime, it, but we're going to put you in jail because you filled out your paperwork wrong, um, you know, 
Is People that, do is that men's every the cause of day. mass incarceration? That, is that the reason? Because men's of, well, you don't have to put somebody in prison. You can tag them for life with a threat. You can threaten to put them in prison. They pay up, not Is that know, the reason fines. for mass incarceration, though? It, no, but, obviously the men's rea, the con concern about mens rea was about the way it was about the way in which large polluters and other industries might be able to claim um, that they simply did not know that they engaged in certain kinds of criminal activity. Absolutely was an, and is an issue that is important for discussion. I'm a lawyer. I believe that there should be knowledge for <laughs> criminal conduct yeah. as well. Um, but that was the focus of it. Was how could it be managed in a way that would not allow a loophole for people, frankly, not the kind of individuals we've been talking about on this panel, but industries and corporations engaged in criminal conduct. The other them, able to get a the path. them we're supposed to go after, I'm, I, not the them listen, we like. Listen, I'm explaining what the objection was because you, you claimed that the Center for American Progress liked the idea of sending people to prison without knowing that what the conduct they engaged in was a crime, and that's silly. No, so let's just talk is, about it. You've got, the, a, you've got, a, you've got your argument, which is a which is a, sh a strong argument about mens rea, yeah. but let's be clear about what the real concern was, which is also a strong and very real concern. So this is part of why if we're gonna build these coalitions, we have to be able to be respectful of the reality. Um, this is why I hate the words right, left, because I work for a nonpartisan organization. It also masks the real issue of race, and it allows people to talk about the Democrats without talking about all of the ways in which many of these issues are infused with very deep societal problems that exist, if you will, on the right and the left, and that need to be explored and talked about honestly if we're to get at answering some of the very difficult questions that we have. And I think we are in a place, as I said before, where because of the crime drop that Grover described and so forth, where we could have, begin to have meaningful conversations about what would we rebuild in the place of what exists. Some of it would be about not criminalizing vices, some, you know, all of the, many of the suggestions that have come out on the panel today. But we need the space to have that conversation. And the space to have that conversation is not to put us in the box of being Republicans and Democrats and right and left, because we are a society facing a criminal justice problem that we have to solve together. And the criminal justice problems that we have are very much um, tweaked by our ongoing centuries-long issues around race and class and gender and so forth. They are there. And if we pretend they don't exist, we're not going to be solving any problem. We're going to be kicking a can down the road, just like people thought they were doing when they passed the Anti-Terrorism and Death Penalty Act and 100 to 1. And they thought they were solving problems, too. So before we get so cute and think that we know how to solve problems, let's hope that we're approaching it a little bit differently and a little bit more expansively than those who came before us did. And that is officially the last word. So we have, <laughs> have a, a round of applause for our panelists. <laughs> you, you guys are free to take the men's raid debate outside. <laughs> <laughs>